But what do leaders do to influence people once they have assumed a new leadership position? In other words, how do leaders lead? So today we're going to talk about you got to transition from being a leader to doing the things that leaders do. First thing they must do is spiritual leaders must pray. A spiritual leader must develop a prayer life. Now, this is just not for pastors. Let's understand when we're talking, we're talking in the context of leaders, plural, not just the pastor, okay? We're talking about Sunday school teachers. We're talking about choir directors. We're talking about usher board directors. Uh, we talk about a whole plethora of the leadership team in the church, not just the pastor. So just focus on your role as a leader. It applies to you when we start talking, okay? All right. First of all, leaders must take a what? A serious approach to their prayer life. If a leader doesn't have a prayer life, he's going to be void. Because prayer is of the essence because that's the way you communicate with God. And you communicate with God in such a way that you can hear him uh, speak to you. It's not just talking, but it's also listening and having feedback from God to give you direction in whatever it is that God is leading you to. So they must take seriously their responsibility of learning to hear from God. Also, spiritual leaders, uh, nothing of eternal significance happens apart from prayer. Nothing of eternal significance. Now, some things can happen, but we're talking about things of what eternal value, spiritual things. It cannot happen apart from prayer. Matter of fact, John 15, 5 says what? You can do nothing apart from me. And so, therefore, you can do some things within your own energy, within your own power, within your own talents, within your own expertise, within your own education abilities, intellectual skills. But when it comes to God's program, the only thing that you can do that's going to be effective and that's going to last is have a strong prayer life because God is the only one that can make it happen. Spiritual leaders must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Spiritual leaders must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, there's a difference between being indwelt with the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Holy Spirit, so we need to clarify that. Being indwelt with the Holy Spirit, every member of the body of Christ, once he accepts Jesus Christ, as his personal Savior, is immediately indwelt with the Holy Spirit. So he has a full measure of the Holy Spirit. So you are full of the Holy Ghost. Everybody that's saved is full of the Holy Ghost. Okay? Now, the problem is, is that we don't always allow that which we are full of control us. Does that make sense? We're full of it, but we don't always yield a portion of ourselves back to that which we're full of. So you're not going to get any more. But what the Holy Spirit wants is more of you. You got all the Holy Spirit you're going to get. But what the Holy Spirit wants on a daily basis is more of you. Okay? Uh, Ephesians 5.18 uh, tells us that. Jeremiah 29.13 says, You will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. With all your heart. You got to seek and search for God. And you can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. So the controlling of the Holy Spirit is a daily activity. And if you're a spiritual leader, you're going to need as much of the Holy Spirit as you yield on a daily basis. You're going to need all you can get. You're going to need the full measure because you're going to be making decisions. You're going to be dealing with people, different personalities. And so a spiritual leader has a totally different role uh, from a secular leader. Okay? Because it's, it's a different uh, product. The bottom line is different. Secular leaders, their bottom line is to do what? Make money. Performance oriented. Spiritual leaders, they're to do what? Transform lives of people. And so, therefore, you're dealing with a totally different dynamic when you become a spiritual leader. So, therefore, you need the Holy Spirit to be able to guide you, which is the Spirit of God. Then the next, spiritual leaders, uh, God's wisdom is imparted through dedicated praying. God's power to change attitudes and circumstances is available through prayer. God is a leader of spiritual leaders. You must understand that. Guys, is, God is wiser than the smartest person in here. I guarantee you. God is wiser than the smartest person in here. I don't care how astute you may be, how articulate you may be. God is wiser than you are. Matter of fact, he knows what the leader's uh, enemies are. He knows who they are. He knows what they're thinking. Okay? He knows where the pitfalls are. He knows where the traps are. He knows how the economy is going to be. God knows everything. So, therefore, you would be wise to do what? Seek his wisdom and whatever it is you're doing, since he's the only one that knows the end from the beginning. We can see the, the end, but we didn't know how it started, and we didn't know what, how it's going to end up. We can see the beginning, but we still don't know what, how it's going to end up. We can't even see the middle. Okay? And so, therefore, God is the only one 
that knows the end from the beginning. So therefore, you would be wise to seek his wisdom and give you instructions. Now, God has the power to change attitudes also. You can't change attitudes. All you can do is make it more abrasive. OK, because your attitude gets <laughs> all out of shape, too, because the attitude won't change. So you get an attitude also. OK, but God is the only one that has the power to change attitudes. And that's through the power of the Holy Spirit. So you have to depend upon the Holy Spirit to be able to do what? Cause those people that may be giving you problems or may be hard or difficult to get along with, turn them over to God. That's where the prayer life comes in at, okay? You pray for them that God will do what? Cause them to be a part of the program. Their attitude will be adjusted and y'all can all be on one page. But you cannot make anybody change, okay? I know you've tried, I've tried, and guess what? You get frustrated. And then you want to fire some folk. Okay, that's the easy way out. Just get rid of them. Well, no, wait a minute. God still has value for those people. He can still use them, but be patient with them and give God an opportunity to do what he does. And he's the one that can change attitudes and cause people's hearts to be on board with the regular program or the mission that you guys uh, has been called to do. Prayer is the best remedy of stress. Prayer is the best remedy of stress. Let me tell you something about stress. Everybody stresses out at some point in time, even little children. See, stress is generic. It's not age, it's not graded, okay, and it's not uh, gender specific, okay? Everybody at some point in time in their lives ha experience stress. Little children experience stress, okay? Stress is a natural uh, emotion, but the body, guess what? The body is not designed to handle stress over a long period of time. It's not designed, that way. It's designed to be free and to float, okay, and, and to have joy and peace. It's not designed to be depressed over a long period of time, but stress in the spiritual world is common just like it is in the secular world. Matter of fact, it's more so because you have to be more patient in the spiritual world with people than you do in the secular world. And so therefore, it's easy to get stressed out uh, in the spiritual world. But prayer is the best remedy. Let's look at the passage of scripture. It's probably one of my most favorite passage of scriptures in the Bible. That's Philippians uh, 4, 6, and 7. And it says that, uh, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Wow. Now, you notice it says, don't be anxious for some things. Is that what it said? Oh, really? It says, don't be what? Anxious for nothing. And that's all inclusive of nothing. Nothing means nothing in this case, okay? Everything that you do, okay, you should take it to God in prayer everything so therefore don't be anxious for nothing but in everything it says by what by prayer and petition with thanksgiving now let me tell you something about that thanksgiving part i like that part because i found out in my walk with christ is that when i start praying for things and stuff but if i start thanking him first for the things and stuff he's already blessed me with the things and stuff that i'm asked for i'll discover a lot of times he's already blessed me with it. oh scratch it off the list oh, i forgot okay that's cool you I, I already got that oh thank you okay and therefore, God is smart, and we are. That's why he says, be thankful first before you start asking. Because sometimes when you start asking, if you're thankful first, you realize, wait a minute, he's already given that to me. I just need the resource to access it, or I just need to act upon it, okay? And then it says, and the peace of God, verse 7, I, I like it. And the peace of God. Now, this is a process, okay? This is a promise. If you'll take everything to God in prayer, and don't be anxious about anything, he says, the, the, the promise is, and the byproduct is, and the prescription for peace is, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will do what? Guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's the promise. It says will. It didn't say it might or it could. It says will. That means if you do what you're supposed to do, take it to God and leave it with him. It says the peace of God will do what? Guard your minds and your hearts in Christ Jesus. That's just awesome. That's awesome. I like that. Uh, spiritual leaders work hard. <laughs> this is not a fluff job, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And brothers and sisters, this is not a fluff job. I don't care what your position is. It's not an easy fluff, fluff off type job. OK, spiritual leaders, if you want to be effective and impact people in God's kingdom, you must work hard. They set the pace and influence others by their example. And I like first Thessalonians chapter three, verse six and nine. Paul is a genius. I like what he says here. He says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you brothers to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the, the teaching uh, you receive from us. In other words, folks that's lazy, don't hang around them. Can I say, now, this is God talking through Paul, through the Holy Spirit, okay? He's saying lazy folk 
I don't care if they're your family members. Don't hang around them, okay? And then he says, uh, next verse says, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you. In other words, Paul, I said an example, okay? We were not idle. Now, Paul could have said, now, look, I'm the apostle Paul, okay? And uh, I was called on the Damascus Road, and God spoke directly to me, and so, therefore, I am somebody, and you need to pay me. I don't need to work because I'm the apostle Paul. Matter of fact, I've written 27 epistles, okay? Some guys say I've written 27 books, okay? But Paul says, he could say, I, I've written 27 epistles, so therefore I am somebody. Y'all just need to pay me. But let's see what he says. <laughs> he says, uh, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to make every, ourselves rather a model for you to follow. Listen, if you want your followers to work hard, they must see you doing what? Working hard right. all the time, okay? If you want to be an example, you have to set the example that do as I say do, that's over. Mm -hmm. This generation don't go for that. Grandma and them may have bought into that, okay? Right. Right. Well, whatever pastor says, you know, he may not be doing it, but he's a pastor. Hey, look, this new generation, they ain't doing that. They got a lot of options. They can stay at home and watch the internet or, or whatever the case may be. You know, they don't have to do what you tell them to do. And so, therefore, if you want to influence your followers, whatever it is you want them to do, you must set that example first. You must be the pattern. And then they'll follow that pattern, okay? So if you want them to work hard, then you do what? You work hard, okay? Uh, and then the next point we see here, work habits and schedules should be a model for other staff uh, to follow and for the volunteers. Uh, a key to successful communication is clarity. We must be able to communicate. A key to successful communication is clarity. Uh, you need to be clear about the church's mission. The church needs to understand uh, what your mission is. You need to be clear about that, okay? And the way you do that is you look in the Bible. Can I just mess you up? Every church, local church, has the same mission, okay? Can I just really mess you up? So I, I know we all have our own mission statements. That's cute. That's good, okay? <laughs> But every church, according to Scripture, has the same mission, and that's to equip the same. We're talking about the local assembly. Now, we're not talking about the body of Christ, okay? The local assembly, every local assembly has the same mission, and that's to equip the saints, according to the Scripture, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And so, my brothers and sisters, every pastor needs to communicate that to his members, okay? It's not a production. It's not about entertainment, okay? It's just not about self-effort. It's about what? Equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. And so therefore, what happens is, if you know what your mission is and everybody's clear on that, everything will do what? That you do will be towards that goal of equipping the saints to do the work of the ministry. In other words, your church will be an education center rather than an entertainment center. Can I get away with that? Amen. Your church will, let me say it again. If you follow the model, the mission that God has already set, so we don't have to try to figure it out, which is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry and so that the lives can be transformed, so they can be followers of Christ on a daily basis, then everything you do, when you structure your organization, everything you do will be what? Structured and geared towards Christian education. It'll be geared towards educate, educating people rather than entertaining people. And it, it won't be activities oriented, it'll be ministry oriented, okay? Proverbs 4 and 7 says, wisdom is superior, supreme rather. Therefore, get wisdom, though it costs all you have, get an understanding. And my definition of understanding is knowing how it works. You can have knowledge of something, but if you don't know how it works, that's all you have is just knowledge. And that's dangerous, okay? And so in this case, knowing how the church works is good. So you have to get an understanding of what God's purpose of the church is, and that's to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And so your members ought to be able to understand that. And so therefore, when you say, well, no, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do that, because they're doing that down the street, because we understand what our mission is, they won't get angry with you. Matter of fact, they won't even bring anything to you that's not education related. Okay? And then the next thing, you must have a clear vision that God has given you. Every local assembly, God has given that pastor uh, a specific revelation uh, from a standpoint of tasks that he wants them to carry out in a particular community. And so therefore, he resources those, those, those churches with the talents and the gifts to carry out those tasks. 
this community right here, for example, okay? Uh, we have a specific task here that uh, Pastor Gaddis doesn't have over in the North Dallas community, okay? We have a, a task here that uh, Brother Shannon Little doesn't have uh, over off of Barnaby Road. Same mission, different demographics and community, different needs, and so therefore our tasks are different, okay? And your people need to be clear on that. Uh, also need to be clear about the organizational structure. We're talking about communication now. The people need to be clear about how your church is organized so they won't come in and try to disorganize it. And so here at New Creation Bible Church, where we do that, we nip that in the bud. <laughs> okay, we have an op orientation manual where we talk about how New Creation Bible Church is organized. Mm -hmm. Okay, and everybody goes through that, that joins, they go to that class and we talk about that. We also talk about the 17 doctrinal things that we believe. That's important. That's a part of organizational, what do you believe? And so we take everybody through that. So everybody will be on the same page as far as doctrinal beliefs and the major things. Everybody will be on the same page as that. You won't have somebody coming in teaching that you can lose your salvation when we teach that you can't, okay? And so therefore, clarity. You need to have clarity going in, uh, communicating certain things to your members. Also, they need to have a clear communication about the history of the church. It's good for people to know the history of the church that they are part of, their local assembly. It's good to know that. That's very important. Uh, matter of fact, I'm going over to uh, uh, Mount Sinai tomorrow. Good to see you, Dr. Jones. I'm going over to Mount Sinai tomorrow. Dr. Jones is a pastor over there. And we're going to do their 38th church anniversary. He sent me a copy of their history. Man, it blows me away. So now when I go over there, I can intelligently see what God is doing and has been doing for the last 38 years in that church. Well, every member of your local church ought to know the history of the church. It's good. It's beneficial. Okay. The most important key is the presence of the Holy Spirit working in the leader's life. Most important key is the presence of the Holy Spirit working in and through the life of the leader on a daily basis. Romans 12, 8, 12, and 13 says, Therefore, brethren, we have an obligation, but it is not to be a uh, sinful nature, but it is not to, rather, the sinful nature, to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. It's important to be led by the Spirit on a daily basis. If not, you're going to experience spiritual death on a regular basis. And I think we all recognize that. We know that. We've tried it, right? Uh, servant leaders, leadership rather, flows from genuine love for the people they lead. Servant leadership flows from genuine love for the people they lead. Now, if you're a pastor or you're a leader of any kind in the church, get the CEO mentality out of your mind. That is not a biblical principle. Okay, get the king and queen mentality out of your mind. That is not a biblical principle. All those things I just named, those people are, are, are to be served. They're not servants, okay? They have servants serving them. But in the biblical realm, a leader is a servant leader. Matter of fact, he leads by serving. So therefore, he becomes a servant leader, okay? He's not puffed up to where people serve him. Now, I, I, I better leave that one alone. But, but let me just say this, okay? Uh, Jesus never did have any bodyguards, okay? Every, matter, of fact, everybody try, matter of fact, every time his disciples tried to guard his body, he said, leave those folk alone. Why do you think I came here? I came here to serve, okay? Let them little kids come over here and play with me. I don't need you to do what? Shield me from the people. I came here for the people. Matter of fact, Christianity is about what? It's a relationship with people and with God. And so why would you have somebody to do what? Deprive you of that relationship. Okay, that's just not biblical. Okay? And so all the armor bearers, I'm going to say this, and it's on tape. Okay? Okay? I'm going to say it. Okay? All these armor bearers and uh, all this entourage and security guards and all this stuff. My brothers and sisters, that is not biblical and it's not spiritual. If you can't depend on God to protect you, you need to get out of the business. And, if, and that's the mafia stuff, okay? And, and the reason the mafia dons have bodyguards because somebody's always after them. Because they were always off somebody else, okay? Now, if you've been going around offing people, okay, yeah, you may need somebody to protect you to keep you from getting off, okay? But if you're just doing what? Walking in the spirit of God on a daily basis, God has your back. God is all the protection you need. And Jesus is the example. You didn't see Apostle Paul walking around with an entourage. Of, uh, all those guys with him were servants. <laughs> okay, they were working. Okay, and so therefore, I don't want to stay on that. <laughs> but, but servants, okay, serve. 
And how do we prove that? 2 Corinthians uh, uh, 12, 15 says, So I will very gladly spend for you everything I have and expend myself as well. If I love you more, will you love me less? In other words, Apostle Paul said, look, I'm willing to be used up by you. How many of y'all in here are ready to be used up by the congregation? They ain't going to let them use me. <laughs> Every time they come, they always want to I'm getting tired of being used. But Paul says, hey, I don't have no problem with that. I'm willing to give everything I got and then guess what? Give myself too. Because he loved what? The people that he was serving. Isn't that awesome? And guess what? He didn't say, that's because y'all love me. He said, no, y'all don't love me. Okay? But that's what? I love you even more. That doesn't stop me from serving you just because you don't love me. And the context of 2 Corinthians is what? Paul was defending his apostleship. The members of the, of the body of Christ of Corinth, they was attacking Paul. So he was a phony. He was a fake. Okay? And Paul says, I still love you. Even though y'all talk about me, you down me, you stab me in the back, I'm still willing to do what? Spend and be spent because I love you. I'll serve you. Okay? Powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. And then leaders must be secure and not enslaved by the opinions and affirmation of others. Listen, I don't care what everybody else does at their church. Don't you allow that to sway you. If it's good, that's fine. And if it's godly, that's fine. Okay? But just taking up other stuff and other personalities that you see that's going on, the best thing you need to do is know what God has called you, know what your personality is, know what your talent is, know what your gift is, and walk in that. Okay? The worst thing you can do is jump through hoops, okay, and try to get other people to affirm you or be looking for affirmation or try to do things that's popular so you can become popular. Mm -hmm. God has only made one Sheila. He's only made one Billy Joe. He's only made one Bill Tony. Just one, okay? And he made us exactly the way he wanted us to be. Now, if he didn't want us to be some other way, he's wise enough and creative enough to have made us a different way. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so, therefore, your ministry is the same way. Whatever God has called your ministry to do, know what that is and do it well. Because guess what? Nobody else can do it as well as you can when you're walking in the Spirit. Psalms 139, 14 says, I praise you because I am fearfully, and how, how, how are we made? Wonderful. Wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. In other words, he says what? I don't want to be a copy. I'm an original. All right. All right. Brothers and sisters, leaders, don't be a copy. Be an original. That's right. Amen. Whatever God has bent you, whichever way he's bent you personality-wise, be that and be that well, and God will use you to the max. But when you try to get out of that element, then you're going to be clumsy. You remember David uh, when Saul tried to put his arm on him, this high-tech stuff? It's awesome, man. I can't walk around that stuff, man. I'm, I'm not, that's designer stuff. I'm not used to that. Give me a slingshot and some rocks. I can work it, okay? Because that's what I'm accustomed to. I, I, I'm, I'm a shepherd boy, you understand? I'm not a warrior at that time. And so therefore, David says, what? I'm not going to try to be a clone of Saul. I'm going to be an original copy. And guess what? He knocked this joker's head off with a rock. You'll do the same thing. If you walk in the power of whatever God has personality-wise has bent you to be, guess what? You will knock folks' heads off. I'm not talking about literally. Okay? I'm talking about it's causing, before it's causing lives to be transformed. You will be effective in your ministry. Be who you are. Okay? And pastors, let me tell you this. If God has bent you a certain way in the pulpit, be that. Okay? Seminary can't teach you how to preach. They can talk to you about what to preach content-wise. But they can't teach you how to preach. Personality does that. You preach out of your personality, not out of form, okay? Not out of a platform. You preach out of your personality. That's when you're most effective. And if you're more effective doing verse by verse, then do that. If you're more effective doing narratives, then do that, okay? If you're more effective doing series, then do that. If you're more effective doing textual type from a topical type thing, then do that. If that's the way you're bent, if that's the way you feel comfortable, then do that. And guess what? You'll be just as effective as the person that does it another way. Y'all need to understand that, pastors. Do the way God has blessed you to do and don't be ashamed of that. Don't ever get up and apologize when you go to another church. Well, you know, I know y'all probably used to it being done this way over here, but this is the way the Lord is living. No, just get up and be who you are. <laughs> and preach and sit down. You got to apologize for who you are. They might, invite, might not invite you back anymore. You know? Hey. Just be who you are, man. And don't apologize. Just do it. <laughs> All right. Spiritual leaders are not their people's servants. They are God's. 
must get that straight. You don't serve the people. You're not their servants. They don't, they don't own you. Although you serve the people, but they don't own you. They're not your master. God is your master. Okay? And you serve God through serving people. But God is your master. So you must understand that you don't have to be afraid of folk. I don't care whether you're a choir director, old usher, whatever. You don't have to be afraid of people. If God has placed you there, okay, I mean, they might talk about you, they might quit, right. might go so. That's okay, okay? But you're not serving them. You're serving in God. You're not trying to please people. You're trying to please God. And if God is pleased, guess what? It don't matter whether you got 10 or 1, you're successful. You're a winner, okay? Romans 1 and 1 says that uh, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. Paul knew who his boss was. He said, I'm a servant of God. Acts of service are motivated and directed by the Holy Spirit. Acts of service are directed and motivated by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12 and 7 says, Now to each one, of, uh, to each one the manifestation, of the, manifestation rather, of the Spirit is given for the common good. Everybody in here that's saved has a spiritual gift. Most, most of you have more than one, okay? And that spiritual gift is not for your benefit. It's not for you to cut up and clown and shine. And, 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 and matter of fact, let me say this. You can't just use your gift whatever you want to either, okay? Because it's not your gift. It belongs to God through the power of the Holy Spirit that, is, that has invested you with this perfect gift. And so, therefore, it's not yours to do what? Just use whenever you get ready. And so, therefore, the Holy, the, the Holy Spirit gives you a gift so that you can do what? Be a benefit to other folk. It's not for you. It's for, that's why it says the what? The common good. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit is for each member to do what? Be able to bless the other members of the body of Christ in whichever way that they are gifted. So everything that you do, your acts of service or what, are motivated by the Holy Spirit. They should be. Should be motivated by you, self-interest, or whatever the case may be. Spiritual leaders, number five, must maintain positive attitudes. This is a biggie with me. Spiritual leaders must maintain positive attitudes. I hate to see a leader walk around with his head down, lips stuck out, shoulders drooped, okay, Always talking about what we going to do. You know, the economy is in a downturn. What we going to do? Folk ain't giving the way they normally give. Folk have got laid off their jobs. We still got this big payroll to meet. What we going to do? Utilities have gone up. Giving has gone down. What are we going to do? Okay? That's not a positive attitude. If the members hear that, Guess what they're going to think? Man, we're going bankrupt. We need to get up and get out of here. <laughs> Ain't no point in me putting my money in that. We get ready to go under. Okay. Spiritual leaders all what? always have a positive attitude. Let me say this. We're not on God's, we're not on the world's economy. Okay? God owns the economy. 